For though we walked through darkest night, now we walk into endless day. Can you hear the voice of Him singing as we come? Can you feel the love of Him calling His daughters and sons?
takes me back to my teen years when there was a bit of Christianity in the house back home and I think mum and dad had a, um, ah, forget the name, Joe somebody and somebody else anyway, a couple of old, older people back then and they were singing that and we grew up on that sort of music and I wonder I didn't like the other style because I love that style. Hey, if the birds hush they're singing then hey. <laughs> um, welcome everybody, welcome to um, the second night of our camp here as we just bask in the warmth and the glory of our Father uh, through the blessing of His Son in our lives. It's been a wonderful day. Is this too loud or it's okay? That's all good for you? It's nice, nice. Um, you probably notice when I'm singing at the moment, I can, I'm singing right down there um, the other day at home. Excuse the advertising, but the, the other day at home, <clears throat> because there's been a bit of a bug around Brisbane and etc. And so many people have got it. Well, yep, I had it. And so my voice was like, you know how I like to sing, I normally sing high. Well, I went to the piano and I went like, do, 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 like, I was like, ah, oh, like, like A, like low A, it was right down there, I'm like, all right, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> But I'm not normally down there. So, yeah, well, welcome to, to this evening. As Again, as we're going to be blessed, I'm sure that um, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, a very interesting message tonight. As uh, It's been interesting to me putting it together. Now, sometimes you begin a study and, and where you go in your study leads you somewhere that you may not have been before. Or sometimes it expands a thought that you may not have had before. And such is the case with this one tonight. What I shall do is bring up that. Okay. So tonight's topic is um, a fire shall devour. Okay. Sounds a bit intimidating, doesn't it? A fire shall devour. And there'll be two sections in this talk tonight, just to let you know. So the first section, um, you may hear some things and you'll be like, what is Gavin talking about? Uh, but understand, I'll move into a second section, uh, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. So before we start, I would like to invite everybody to kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Gracious Father, we, we thank you for the awesome first day that we've enjoyed, the beautiful messages that we've had throughout the day, the enlightenment, the encouragement, the, the refreshment that we've received already from three different presentations. Father, you are so good to us in, in giving us these messages. We are mere... Um, voices for you to speak through and tonight it's my turn and I just pray once again that your spirit will speak through me uh, and that your spirit will touch every person that is here in, in my presence in your presence and all those that will hear the message in the future we commit this hour to you we look forward to the blessing from you and I thank you, Father, that you are always faithful. Open up everybody's ears and minds and hearts to receive what you want for them individually. And I thank you that you hear this prayer and answer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we... We'll be looking at Psalm 50 verses 1 to 6 this evening. And it's nice up there on the screen, beautiful size up there, nice and clear. And I'll just read it straight through as an intro. A Psalm of Asaph, the mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. 
Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. This evening, we will discuss this short passage, and we'll discuss it in the context of uh, the book that we've been reading recently, Christ Our Righteousness by E.J. Wagner. Uh, we'll be taking his views in the first section of the talk tonight, and then after that I'll leave that aside and I'll go on to just share some of my thoughts. Okay? So there will be two parts. What I found interesting was that Wagner used this passage, Psalm 50, verse 1 to 6, and 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, to show that this passage in Psalms is actually referring to Jesus. And his point being that it talks about the mighty God the Lord and his point is to prove that Jesus is the mighty God he is the Lord which of course we most definitely agree with he he is all of that and uh, so we'll just jump straight into it the mighty God even the Lord hath spoken and called unto the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down Thereof. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken. Okay, the context? Very simple, nothing deep about this one. Who's it talking about? The mighty God. The mighty God. We'll move on to verse 2. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. So God shone out of Zion. Obviously, Asaph was referring to the city of Zion, which of course is Jerusalem, God's city, the place of his people. The parallel of this, if we bring it into the context of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, which is at the end of time, would be God shining through his people at the end of time. I think that's pretty obvious. So it will be God that shines out of his last day people, Zion. And that is how God shines. He shines out of people. Because we do not have any light in and of ourselves, the words God has shined must be referring to God shining through us. God doesn't shine without us. I guess he can shine through his word. But in reaching people that don't have his word, that don't read his word, he will shine out of us. And it must be his spirit working in us and through us that causes his light to shine. Since, of course, we don't have any natural light of our own, do we? Okay. All in agreement. In this way and this way alone can Zion be the channel of God to shine through. That God does the shining, not Zion by itself. It is God shining out of Zion that causes his message to go to all the earth. And then, of course, we know when the message goes to all the earth, the end will come. That's what we're waiting for. Verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Wagner relates that to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. That's a lot of noise. 
There's, there's three aspects of noise there, with a, loud, with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. So he certainly, when he comes, will not keep silence. And what is the end result of all of that noise? The dead in Christ rise first. Amen? Did I put that there? Yep. The dead in Christ rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall join them together. What a day that will be. But the verse doesn't finish with our God shall keep silence. For it says, a fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous around about him. Although there's nothing specific in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, about the fire, we only need to start reading chapter 5, and I did put it there. We only need to start reading in chapter 5 to find these words. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9 reiterates this point. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, second coming, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And I can feel the shudders going down everyone's spine. How we've read that in the past, huh? Interesting. This all ties back, of course, to Psalm 50 and verse 3, where it states, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Now, without getting to the theology of this point at this moment, I just want to emphasize Wagner's point that these verses in Psalm 50 lined up with the verses here in Thessalonians is that the God of Psalm 50 is Jesus of 1 Thessalonians 4. That was the point that Wagner was bringing out. Not all the other stuff. Okay, that was his point. That's the point I'm making. And it goes on to say in verse 4, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 17, it says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it, begin, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Since it is God who shines out of Zion and it is God who comes and will not keep silence and it is God around who it is tempestuous, then it must be God that has the fire that goes before him as he judges his people. And all this as paralleled in, first pa in the passage of 1 Thessalonians 4 is referring to Jesus. That's the point. That we're making at the moment. Verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And quoting Matthew 20. What have I missed something? Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Didn't have it. Uh, yeah, 2431. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So you can see the parallels here. You, you, you can see how Wagner was going, oh yeah, that is that, that is that, that is that. Okay, cool. Well, then that must be Jesus. Jesus must be 
the mighty God, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And what do we get? Lord. Yahweh. Jesus. Yeah. Jehovah. Okay, so this, this is the point that he was making. And Wagner finishes making his point in verse 6. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Quoting the New Testament, where Jesus said, All judgment has been given to the Son. The Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Um, Wagner confirms that Jesus is judge and that Jesus is the mighty God, even the Lord. Okay? How these verses have been explained are pretty standard Christian beliefs, Adventist beliefs, the way that I've read them. And isn't it interesting how when we read those words with the carnal mind, how it sort of startles you now. I don't know about you, but as I was reading it was just like, wow, that's pretty confronting. And that's cool. Jesus once said, how readest thou? How do you understand? All as I've done is just put the words up there. I, I haven't explained nothing. I just put the words up there. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because in your heart and in your mind, you'd be going, oh, Gath. Okay, or oh, what's going on? That's cool. That's great. So, um, yes. And so what it does is it establishes Jesus as the mighty God, the Lord, the judge, and the Redeemer, who will gather his elect at the second coming and execute judgment upon the wicked by fire. That's what all those scriptures said. So what I want to do now is change colour. <sighs> Don't you feel better now? In the middle of winter, those first screens would have been really nice. And so I've changed screen because I'm changing direction. I want to show you now what I got out of Psalm 50 because um, what I, I've begun doing is the studies that we're doing on Tuesday nights at our place. I've begun doing that with my sister, Tracy. And I love one-on-one -on -one. because when there's one-on-one, -on -one, you can get more intimate and the mind really just is allowed to wander more than when you're in a big group. And so I, I was studying with my sister and, and oh, wow, the stuff that just kept flying into my mind that day. And then amazingly, in the afternoon, I went with, I picked up Hanya and took her to the hospital. And uh, as you always do when you're with Hanya, straight into the beautiful spiritual topics and, oh, Gav, what do you got something new for me? <laughs> I said, oh, well, I'll tell you what I was telling Tracy this morning. And as I was telling Hanya, as we were driving along, more stuff popped into my head and expanded even more. So what I want to do this evening is just share a little bit of the expansion, um, the expanded view that I have on that. And you'd be very pleased to think that she's part of the presentation. Amen. And good evening, Hanya, because you'll be watching this tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> she's all set up, ready to watch. So having a different uh, set of glasses, the character of God glasses, we might call them, as we read the same passages of Scripture, helps us to see things in a completely different way. Well, I should speak on my, for, for myself, really, shouldn't I? It, it, it's, it's made me see things in a completely different way. And, and I, yeah, just want to share a bit of that this evening. Uh, I'll give you an example of how God's Word can be read in a different way, and you, when you read it, may get something completely different again. And that's really cool. And I love that, how that God can speak to each one of us individually, and we'll get our own things out of them. And as my dear brother up the back often says, this is my study, this is what I got out of it, and if you get something else out of it, great. And if you see something that might be a bit eh, erroneous, you come and talk to me, eh? We discuss it, share it, and together we grow. Isn't that the spirit of Protestantism? That we sit together, we discuss things, and we grow together with a humble spirit. That's, that's what I like to do, sit with people and have a chat. 
Brotherhood of believers. Brotherhood of believers. That's how I learn so much, sitting with other people and learning from them. And by God's grace, sometimes they learn stuff from me too. So praise God. All right. The word is a living word. You've heard of that? The scriptures are the living word, which means it's constantly growing and developing. Amen. And part of the growing and developing is a blossoming. Because when, it, when, it, when a tree or a vine grows, you know, it's nice for it to grow, but then it will blossom. And that's when it's at its most magnificent, isn't it? When you've got all the blossoms on it. And if it's a fruit tree, because in, you know, in the Word of God we often hear about fruit, when you see the blossom, what do you know is coming? Fruit. Fruit's coming. So if the Word of God is not blossoming in our life, there's probably no fruit coming. Amen? But if we get blossoms, if we start to see beautiful things in God's Word, then there's probably fruit just around the corner. And does not the scripture say that the husbandman waits for the precious fruit? So when he sees us starting to blossom with his character, he's like, all right, there's fruit coming. And what happens once the fruits come? And there's the harvest. He's waiting for the precious fruit. Okay. So, so what I want to do tonight is share and, and show how not only... Can these scriptures in Psalm 50 refer to Jesus' second coming? But I want to show how they can refer to Jesus' ministry at every point in time. Okay? Even back when he walked in Jerusalem, even tonight, in your life and mine. Okay? That's what I like to try and do. So, the mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. And I just put there, God calls. God is always calling. From that first day in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ruined everything, Jesus came down. To the garden and called, didn't he? First thing he did was called. Adam, where are you? And he's been constantly calling ever since. Ever since. Called Enoch. And Enoch heard the call. Even came down to Cain. Cain didn't hear the call properly. Um, Noah. Abraham, Samuel. Samuel, 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 Moses. But he didn't stop calling just there in the Old Testament. Jesus came and he called. And he's still calling. He's called you and he's called me. Why are we here? By accident? Or did we hear a voice? Did we hear a still small voice? No. Oh. Because what did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. And they follow. Okay? Praise God. He never stops calling. In Hebrews, chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Okay, when God spoke it to the fathers by the prophets, who did he speak through? He spoke through Jesus. And we know that because of 1 Peter 1.11. I haven't got that up on the screen. But we know that it was the Spirit of Christ that was in them. 1 Peter 1. And 11. So it was Christ in the Old Testament that was speaking, and then Hebrews goes on to say here now, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son. But, but that's what he was always doing. But now it was in the flesh. It was in person. It was warm and personal. It was hands-on. Same person. Did Jesus stop calling after he went back to heaven? 
He didn't stop calling. No. Nope. He's continued to call. Saul of Tarsus. He met him on the road to Damascus. And uh, what a call that was. What a turnaround that was. And so he never stops calling and he's still calling today. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you've had experiences in your own life like Saul. That you've been turned around. I, I hope that's the case. There's, there's, there's nothing... There's probably nothing sadder for me than to hear of people that have grown up as Christians that it's sort of just like, it's just the norm, nothing's ever changed. Either they've had a brilliant start and they're still just going full, full bore, or they may not have actually had a conversion and met, heard Jesus calling and had a change. Because when, when you hear Jesus call, Wow, does it change. And so, praise God, he never stops calling. And so, from the rising of the sun, not yet, uh, from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, Jesus is constantly on the lookout and calling that, he might re that we might return to him. His spirit is striving with our hearts to bring conviction and conversion and to set us on the path to his Father's throne in glory. And just like that, you know, it said in, in Genesis that my spirit shall not always strive with man for his years will still will yet be 120. And so it's the spirit of God constantly trying to woo people until nobody would respond anymore. That same spirit is still operating today, trying to woo people to receive the Son of God and thus the Father. Because he who has the Son has the Father, has life, the life of the Father. He that honours the Son honours the Father, Jesus said. So, we need to hear that still small voice. Lay aside the sin that so easily besets us, that gets in our ways, in, in, in the way, and, and stops us from hearing the voice. We need to repent of our sins and follow on to the high calling and high and precious calling of Jesus Christ. And I love the message of repentance. That the repentance misunderstood is, is terrible. Repentance misunderstood is terrible. Because people think like, what, why are you condemning me? Why, why, why are you picking on me? Why are you... And it's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand repentance. Repentance is there's something blocking you from a deeper walk with Jesus. And the repentance is, hey, just put it aside so that you can have a better walk with Jesus. That's what repentance is. And so I love it. I love it when people tell me about stuff in my life. Um, when I have time to reflect. Now, sometimes we are human. And when we hear somebody say something to us, just like... <clears throat> But, hey, take the time. Settle down. And listen to what was actually being said. Because sometimes God can actually use people. And sometimes even the closest ones to us. You know, praise God for, for, for wives. And praise God for husbands. Because sometimes they will say something that the carnal nature will go. <clears throat> but the spiritual nature will go, yeah, Lord, thank you. Thank you that, you know, for, for example, Zlatan has pointed that out. And, uh, yeah, helps me to grow, and that will help us to grow when we receive those things patiently. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty God hath shined. What is Zion? Well, again, originally it was a specific hill to the, excuse me, to the south of Mount Moriah. The term Zion later became synonymous with Jerusalem, the city of God, and still later on became synonymous with the people of God. See how words mature and develop in their meaning. Therefore, we can see in this verse an interesting parallel for us. God wants to shine out of us if we're part of Zion. He wants to shine out of us as individuals, as couples, as families, as fellowship groups, 
as his church on earth in the last days. That's what he wants to shine out of. Jesus said, where two or three three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst. And what happens if Jesus is in the midst of of two or three of us? What should happen? We should start to shine. Hey, cause and effect. Jesus is there. We will start to shine. If we're not shining, what might that mean? Mmm, mercy. Don't answer that one. Mmm. And he wants to shine right across the world. To the north of Queensland, to the south of Queensland, to the length and breadth of Australia and beyond. To all the people that are watching this presentation, God wants to shine in and through you. To let the world know how good he is. Let's let him do it. For we are the light of the world, Jesus said. Is there anything in our lives that's stopping this from happening? Is there any covetousness? Is there any selfishness? Is there any bitterness? Is there any anger? Hmm. Resentment. Jealousy. Sin of any kind that would grieve our Father's spirit and stop the shining from happening. There's a scripture that says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. And it, again, it's just not a, it's not a slap over the wrist, oh, you naughty boy, you're not even in the faith. It is, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Because as a Christian, don't we want to be in the faith? And if we're in the faith, we will shine. Because that's the light shining on you. Mm-hmm. So that you can then shine it out. Yep. Exactly. And so the examination has to be of self. One thing that Christians can be really good at is examining everybody else. Okay? Uh, I'm looking, uh, I'm watching. Okay? And, and that's what we do. We spend our time looking at everybody else and forget that you know, they're the bad guys. They don't know what I know. They don't practice what I practice because of what I know. So they're the bad guys. And it's just like, as you judge, Gab, as you judge, boy, Hmm, got to stop that. Okay, there is a problem with being a great judge or being judgmental. So he wants to shine out of us. The result will be he will shine in the beauty, in the perfection of beauty in Zion, in us. That's what he wants to re- to shine in the perfection of beauty big difference to the perfection of legalism the perfection of beauty the blossom because what follows the blossom the fruit the fruit hmm legalism doesn't bring fruit (laughs) if it is it's pretty um maybe bitter sour off rotten but god's fruit no not like that Mm-hmm. The vine that Jesus yeah, the vine that has no fruit on it, or the, the fig tree that had no fruit, yeah. So the world will then be lightened with his glory as God shines through us, and the end will come, but not before. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The, the end of the world is not going to come because of how bad man is, how bad the governments are, how bad all sorts of things are. No, 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 no. The end will come when the earth has been lightened with the glory of God. That's my favourite theme. The world will not be lighted with the theory of truth. It will be lighted with the living truth. As the truth lives in us. As Christ, the truth, lives in us. Christ in us. The hope of glory. Christ in us. The hope of shining. Now. Truth to have any impact must be living, it must be warm, it must be loving, it must be faithful. Truth will overcome sin, not in others, in self. Self will be humbled when truth enters the heart. Amen? If truth makes us proud, look what I know, or rebellious, Oh, look at them, they should have known better. And we start to get angry at others because they don't know what we know now. 
then it's not the truth. It might seem like truth. We might have a theory of truth, but it isn't the truth because it's not living. And the word of God is living and growing and blossoming and produces fruit of the Jesus kind. Amen? Our faces will be shining. When Jesus came to our world, he, humble as a man, he lit up Jerusalem with his light. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God was seen in the face of Christ Jesus. <laughs> One step ahead of me. And so, surely, Psalm 50 and verse 2 was fulfilled in the life of Jesus in general, through his whole life, from his childhood, but really specifically... Um, in those three and a half years when he went about ministering. In all that he did, he glorified his father's name. And he drew many to him through his ministry. We move on. What was that? I don't know where that comes Oh, yeah, I've just been forgetting to. That. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. We'll just focus on that first part of the verse at this moment. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Before we looked at about, about Jesus' second coming. But let's go back to his ministry in Jerusalem. When Jesus came to this world and began his ministry, one thing he did not do was keep silence. He had all kinds of messages for all kinds of people. And his message was urgent. For the kingdom of heaven was at hand, even in his day. Doesn't matter which era that we live in, the kingdom of heaven is always at hand. For each one of us as an individual, it may only be 30, 60, 90 years. And that's pretty close at hand. You ask all of us elder people how quickly life goes by. It's crazy how fast life goes by when you're this age compared to when you're that age. It's, it's amazing. So the kingdom of heaven is at hand today. Jesus had a message. It was urgent. And so he spoke by the sea. He spoke on the mountain. He spoke in the synagogue and he spoke by the well. He spoke in people's homes. He spoke out in public. He spoke to thousands at a time. And he spoke to individuals. He spoke in the day. And he spoke at night. He spoke from a ship. And he spoke from a cross. And every word that Jesus had was urgent. For whoever he spoke it to. For, for each of us has but one life. And the word that we hear is urgent before we die. And none of us know when our last day will be. The message of the kingdom of heaven is at hand among the many others Jesus proclaimed during his three and a half years of ministry. Was enough to return hearing to the deaf and sight to the blind. To bind up the broken hearted, to bring comfort to the mourning, to set the captives free. He could not keep silence because his words were spirit, and truth and life. Jesus broke the silence that had prevailed in Israel for way too long. What do I mean by that? Why do I say that Jesus broke the silence? Because truth had been silenced by those who were walking in the traditions of men. Those who were leaders and teachers in Israel for way too long had, had kept the truth silent. And so Jesus broke that silence. The breaking of the silence by Jesus brought renewed hope to the people who had been sitting in darkness. When they heard his words, it brought great light. Words like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Those words are just as applicable to the 6th of April, 2023, as they were back then, as recorded in Matthew 5. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets that were before you. People don't tend to like people that bring God's message. For some reason. I hope that's not us. I hope we love God's word. I know we do. Just saying it. I know that the people here love God's word. And they love to be challenged. Don't we love to be challenged by God's word? Amen. God's word never goes stale. Was the bread of life never stale? Bread of life's never stale. Give us this day our daily bread. If the bread we're given every day is eaten, can't go stale. Mm -hmm. And if we eat it every day, there's more bread tomorrow. Fresh every day. So these kind of words broke the silence and dispelled the darkness that had held the people captive for years. Amazingly, even with these incredible words of hope and comfort from Jesus, even while bringing joy to the multitudes, these same words were driving a wedge between himself and those who would not hear them. They wouldn't hear his words. Those who would not respond positively to him. To those who would not hear him, those who would not follow the master teacher, his words were taken as threats, as harsh sayings, as great judgments against them. Jesus' words, the same ones that were light and beauty to the weak and desperate, were dark and threatening to those who did not have the Spirit of God in them. Amazing. Same words. They had not a love of the truth. Had not a love of the truth. Amen. And in the face of all of this, Jesus would not keep silence. Not while there were souls to save. He had to speak. He had to teach. He had to call. The purpose of his very mission was to tell people about the kingdom of his Father and to call them to the wedding feast while supplying the very garment that they would wear to that feast. Even if it meant people would be outraged and even wrongly offended at him for what he was teaching and doing, Jesus would not keep silence. He loved too much to keep silent. We need to be wise when we speak. Because... We also don't want to be foolish and rush in when we shouldn't speak. But Jesus, under the guidance of the Spirit of God, under the guidance of his Father, knew when the time was to speak and knew what to say at the right time. That's very important. And that's the prayer aspect in our lives. Because if it's just Gavin speaking, because I can't keep silence, i just got to tell everybody... Then I'll, I'll probably make a mess. Hmm. Yeah. So there's an wis- a, a, a aspect of wisdom that we must also remember. And so, our God shall come and shall not keep silence. That's what Jesus did. A fire shall devour before him. Again, we've looked at it in, in the context of the second coming. Let's continue to look at it in the context of Jesus uh, in the Gospels. Now, I would suggest from my reading of the Gospels, a fire shall devour before him. So I would suggest from the reading of the Gospels, as I've read them, that Jesus wasn't an arsonist. I don't pick that up from the Scriptures. He didn't go around lighting fires to devour people's homes and the people in it. So as I read that Scripture, the fire, I don't think, was a literal fire. The, the only fires G, G, 
Jesus would have ever lit would have been to help his mum to bake the bread, to warm the house in the winter, to sit around at night time and talk to the disciples. They, they were fires. But it sure, certainly wasn't to devour. Jesus wasn't an arsonist. And if he is the same yesterday, today and forever, will he ever be an arsonist? No. There's some significance in that, brothers and sisters. Jesus can never be an arsonist. And I don't recall him ever throwing anybody onto the sacrificial altar in the temple at Jerusalem. I don't read that either. It just didn't happen. So what is the fire? This is the point. This is the question that we're going to look at now. This may be something that people haven't thought about. Maybe you have. People that are watching later on, maybe you thought about it. Maybe you haven't. What is this fire that devours? We, we should look at this. Because the correct understanding is life-changing. Amen? It's life-changing when we understand the fire. Jesus said, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So if we search the Scriptures to, this, to, to find the meaning of fire, that should tell us something about Jesus, if I'm putting the pieces together correctly. So what fire did Jesus bring to Zion when he walked among men? How are we going? Okay. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Okay, clue number one. The word of God is like a fire. Now, earlier, Jeremiah had contemplated how hard it was to speak for God, to be a prophet of God, to have the messages to take to all, all the people, and it was really getting him down. He's just like, oh, shrugs his shoulders. Did I put it up? I'm not sure. Yes, I did. Then he said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. So he sort of said, I've, I've had enough. I, I can't do this anymore. It's, this is hard. And then it's got the word but. And he just thought it reflecting, mm, but his word in my heart was like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Did Jeremiah stop his ministry at that point? No. It's only Jeremiah chapter 20. He continued to minister like right through the rest of his book. The fire that burned in him compelled him to go and speak God's words. And may that be our case as well. And so the word was a burning fire in his heart. That's the point. What about the guys that Jesus spoke to on the road to Emmaus? He walked with them. How were they? They were sort of down, just like Jeremiah. Oh, oh. Jesus is like, what's going on, guys? Oh, haven't you heard? Where you been, boy? Where you been? Haven't you heard what's going on the last few days? And then Jesus starts to explain the scriptures to them and then hear their response. And they said to one another, because then um, once the veil as it were removed from their eyes, did he, did he break bread or he prayed or something? And it's like, that's Jesus. And then Jesus just was gone. And then they just looked at each other and they're like, wow, didn't, didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way? While he opened to us the scriptures? Again, the scriptures are presented and there was a burning in their heart. There was this, wow. That's what the fire of God's word does. That's what it should do in people's lives. And so, what does this mean? Revelation 11.5. Since we're looking at this, you know, I just quickly thought I'd throw this up. If any man will hurt them, the two witnesses of Revelation 11, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemy. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. I've heard Christians, not of our faith, but I've heard Christians read that literally. Two witnesses, they get killed, and after three days they raise again, and then fire comes out of their mouth, devours all the enemies. And I've literally heard preachers of other faiths 
say that that's literal. Oh, oh dear brothers. But there is a fire, and this is important. This is an important point as we're moving forward here, looking at this fire. For it proceeds out the mouth and devours the enemies. Fire comes forth, devours. Next verse. Wherefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, again talking to Jeremiah, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire. And this people would, and it shall devour them. Can we possibly read that as literal? No? Boy, you speak soft. <laughs> no, I, how can you read that as literal? My words in your mouth are fire. And I'll devour the people because I'm going to turn them to wood. No, of course not. But these are the keys that unlock a lot of the tricky passages in Scripture. That's the point. Malachi chapter 3. Actually, before I read that, the same word, the same fire that warm, that can warm people's hearts and that their hearts burn within them in love, attracted to God's word, the same words can cause a devouring to people that are wood. And we'll get onto that in a little bit, what that means. That reject it, that don't want to hear it. So, yeah, now, Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Okay, who would that be? Bible students? John the Baptist. Amen. So my messenger, John the Baptist, he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. So who's the Lord that comes to his temple? Christ. Christ, Jesus. Even the messenger of the covenant, now that's significant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. Wasn't working. So he comes to his temple. The next bit says, when he comes to his temple, but who may abide the day of his coming? Who, who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Oh, not as wood. As gold and silver this time. Notice the wood gets devoured, the gold and silver gets purified. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Hmm. I know that you're understanding what I'm saying. So how was Christ like a refiner's fire? I guess that's the question. Again, he wasn't an arsonist. He, he, he wasn't even a, oh, what's the word, metallurgist or something. I'm not sure what the word is. A, a, a blacksmith with silver? Yeah, would you call it a blacksmith with silver? I don't know. But anyway, he, he didn't work with silver um, in that sense. But it says he would come and be like a refiner's fire to purify. Again, can we take this literally? No, not literally. Because people aren't gold and silver literally. But there's beautiful metaphors here, isn't there? Beautiful metaphors. Um, the language of this passage reminds me of judgment. Purifying. Because that's what judgment's really all about. And so here I have, behold, um, Daniel 7, and we'll do 9 to 11. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame. Hello. And his wheels as burning fire. 
all through the scripture, this stuff in the amazing. And so the ancient of days are sitting on something. It's a throne, like a fiery flame. And the wheel's burning. What what is this throne established on? Okay. Next. Thy throne is established of old. You are from everlasting. But the question, what is his throne established on? Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's really good for the angels because they know God doesn't just keep chopping and changing his rules and regulations, his laws, etc., etc. His word is established, his throne is established upon his word, which never changes. It's forever settled in heaven because it's settled in God's heart. He can't keep changing his story. Okay? That's important. And so, if God's throne is a fire and his word is settled in heaven forever and his word is the foundation of his throne does it not stand to reason that his throne could appropriately be symbolized as being a fiery throne if the word is a fire then it would be a fiery throne set upon wheels of burning oh there's some complicated stuff there isn't it interesting yeah, I think it's interesting. So what, what's, the, what's the wheels of burning? Again, Gavin's thoughts. You, you may have some other thoughts we can share later. Um, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. So... Who are the thousands and thousands? Well, Psalm 104, verse 3 and 4, and 68, 17, and I'm pretty sure I didn't put them up there. Um, and so I'll read them. Who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks upon the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. I should have put that up. He makes his ministers a flame of fire. Wow. The angels themselves receiving the word of God, which is like a fire, are themselves flaming fire. Why? Because they carry within them the word of God. And while we're at that, while, yeah, while we're thinking of that, what happened in Acts chapter 2? When there was a rushing wind, what did we see upon each person? Tongues of fire. Had those people received the word of God? Yes. Amen. Had they received the oil of the Spirit? And is it possible that the angels who were ministers on God's behalf also came down and were excited to be part of it and showed their presence? as tongues of fire on each person. Because we each have a guardian angel. And maybe, no, I can't say that. You know how divinity flashed through humanity in Jesus? I'm just thinking, maybe the, the flame of the fire of the angels flashed through in their own spiritual form. I don't know, I'm just imagining. But there was tongues of fire, but it didn't burn anybody. Nobody's hair caught a light and needed water to put it out. It was a spiritual significance that the word of God from that day, under the latter rain, for them, was about to go. That fiery flame. Somebody, yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we should be angels, because angels are ministering for God. And... Um, and we should be the same. We should be ministering for God, as as it were, angels, ministers. Uh, so the word was being spoken to those people beforehand at Pentecost, mm -hmm. and then they were no longer silent because everybody spoke and mm -hmm. everybody was able to be heard. Yes, and if you want to take that, continue with that, they were no longer silent, and a fire broke forth before them. Yes. 
and devoured. Okay, some people received it and were converted. The sin was devoured. And some people rejected it and it became tempestuous around them. Okay? Works all the time. It's interesting. Okie dokie. So, putting all these pieces together, we find the throne of God like a fiery flame, established on his word, which is like a fire. His word, sorry, his word like a fiery stream comes to the angels who then minister to him and stand before him, and they also minister to us. And when all this takes place, because it's the word, the word, the word, the word comes to us. When all this takes place, the judgment is set and the books are open because we have to decide what we are going to do with the word. And thus, we make a judgment. And God just confirms our judgment. The books, remember what the books are? We are an epistle written of God and read of all men. I think it goes something like that. Okay, and so what happens in verse 11, just to finish off this little bit in Daniel, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke. Now that's interesting. The horn has his own set of words. Judgment set, books open, turns now here to the horn, and the horn has his own great words. God has words. The horn has words. I beheld till the beast was slain and his body destroyed, given to the burning flame. As you judge your words, so you shall be judged by your words. Is it possible that the burning flame is symbolic of self-judgment? Just a thought. Given to the burning flame. Rejected God's word, became judgmental, received the judgment. So according to Malachi, God's word is supposed to be a purifier. That is what God's word is supposed... Sorry. That is what God's purpose for his word is. To cleanse our life and to restore our joy. To those who receive God's word, it becomes a purifier of their life, like a refiner's fire. But to those who reject the refining fire, which brings purification and joy, the very same fire, the very same words, bring a completely different outcome. Isn't that a marvellous thing? A marvellous thing. A spiritual thing. Let's look. Oh, yeah. I, I just threw that in as a last thought. Um... Romans 1, 24, 26, 28, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them up to their own choices, their own desires, their own lusts, their own will. He gave them up and those things destroyed themselves. That's why I just threw that up there. Their own burning flame. Okay. So let's move to John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world <clears throat> that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, what's this mean? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, who brought the fire of God to this world. What, did he, what was he called? In the, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Using the thought line that we're following this evening, in the beginning was the fire, and the Word was with, and the fire was with God, and the fire was God. Our God is a consuming fire. Isn't that interesting how that works? Mm -hmm. The Word. Mm. Baptize you in spirit and with fire. Mm, it's all interesting. So God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. The fire of God didn't come to the world to literally devour. Jesus isn't an arsonist. 
His word, he came to save the world, that the world through him might be saved. The word was supposed to purify and save. Verse 18, 19. But he that believed on him not, sorry, he, he that believed on him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already. Just two different attitudes towards the same word. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Okay, so where does condemnation come from? Keep reading. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. Michael, we went camping once, eh? We lit a fire. What was it like around the campsite while the fire was going? It was warm, it was bright, we could see, we could play the guitar, we could talk, everything while it was bright. I guess we could talk and play the guitar when the fire went out, but when the fire went out, it was certainly dark. Okay? So we didn't let it happen. We just kept putting more fire wood on, more wood on, more wood on to keep the fire going. Um, I didn't even bring my Bible tonight, but I've got it all up there. Um, I was going to hold up the Bible. Keep the fire going. Keep your fire burning. Keep stoking it every day. Amen? Condemnation is people let the fire go out or they don't even want to start it. And then they don't benefit from it. And Jesus said, He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Can you hear fire coming out of that verse? The fire shall judge in the last day. The word. That's all Jesus is saying. Wax and clay. We, we've all heard this story before, this analogy before. The same fire, the same heat put on these two different elements. One's wax, one's clay. One becomes soft. Pliable even, depending on how much heat. What a heat, it'll just melt and start running. But um, clay, hard, potentially brittle, dry. And um, it just gives us a little analogy of what it's like when God's Word... God's Word only ever shows what's in us, what we are like. And so if we're hard, if we're brittle, if we're dry, um, it's just showing what... We're probably clay. But if we're soft, pliable, adaptable, is that a word? Adaptable, flowing, then probably God's Spirit's working, His fire is working in our lives. The important thing to remember is that Jesus' words are not condemning in and of themselves. Our rejection of them is what brings condemnation, self-condemnation. When we come face to face with our own foolish, foolishness and sin in rejecting the words of life while standing in the presence of God, who is the truth, we will, according to our natural tendency, condemn the guilty. Isn't that what we always do? We're always condemning the guilty. During our life, it's always been the other person that's guilty. And we always condemn them. It's never me. It's always the other person. But standing before the throne of God, with no one else to blame, with no one else to condemn, but ourselves, who, what will we do? We've got to blame someone, and we'll, we'll blame self. We'll condemn self. In the presence of God, we will condemn self, because there'll be no one else to blame. It's a terrible habit. It's a carnal habit to blame everybody else. Everybody else but me. Remember that song? Yeah. And we will do it again, but this time it will be con the condemnation will be against self, and the condemnation will be death. I deserve to die. And you might think, well, 
We will pronounce our own death decree. We will say, I deserve to die. I'm unworthy of forgiveness. And you might think that that sounds crazy. Why would I ever do that? Surely that's not in me to condemn myself to death. But let me remind you of a man called Judas Iscariot who betrayed Christ, but did Christ ever condemn him? No. No one condemned him. No one condemned him except self. Exhibit A. Self-condemnation in the presence of the very one who is the personification of forgiveness caused him to go and hang himself. The mystery of iniquity. The mystery of condemnation. Because he condemned everybody, didn't he, during his life. Oh, these people want that, these people want that. Oh, we could have used that money for this. Condemn everybody constantly. And when there was no one else to blame, when he had to face his own guilt, he went and hung himself. Brothers and sisters, we've got to stop condemning others. Because it will be a habit that will destroy us. At the end of time, at the end of the thousand years, that's what I'm talking about, at the end of time, this will be the experience of all who reject God's word. Not that they will go and hang themselves, but they will condemn themselves to death. And their hearts will fail them for fear in the presence of God. I'm going to take this backwards now. Yep. I'm going to take this back, 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 way back to Pharaoh. Here's a man who had who made a lot of bad decisions. We all agree to that. How things could have been so different for him and his people. God's word came to him via Moses. And they were simple words, potentially comforting words. Let my people go so they can hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Is there any condemnation in those words? That's all that he was asked. No condemnation in the words whatsoever. Only a potential blessing for Pharaoh. God's people could have gone to the feast if Pharaoh had allowed them. And they would have been blessed and refreshed and then come back to Pharaoh ready to serve with renewed vigor and faithfulness. If I remember correctly, didn't they just want to go for three days? Okay, which means they would have come back. But how the story would have been different. And now, it's, of course, it's all hypothetical because it never happened that way. So we don't know how it would have turned out. But God's intention was to bless my people, refresh my people, and send them back to Pharaoh. Wouldn't Pharaoh have gone like, what kind of God do you have? Slaves never come back when they've been just let out the front door. But it's hypothetical, like I said. Pharaoh rejected the fire, the word that come from Moses. He rejected the fire that would have brought purification and blessing to his kingdom, and instead... He turned it into a curse. The refreshing spirit God's people would have received at the feast would have returned with them to Pharaoh's household and kingdom. Amazing thought. God wanted to bless Pharaoh through the channel of the children of Israel. But instead of allowing the blessing to come into his land, Pharaoh pushed God's protection, protective hand away. Don't we see something like that in our world today towards Christians and God? Pushing God's protection away. Blocking Christians from having a feast. From worshipping in different countries, in different places. All that sort of stuff. So what happened next? When Pharaoh rejected the invitation of God. The land suffered its first curse or plague. Because Pharaoh pushed away God's protection, the blessing that he wanted to give them. And so the plague came, not directly from God, but from Pharaoh, slowly, like I just said, pushing 
God's hedge of protection away. And this process of offered blessing from God, the rejection of it by Pharaoh, the plagues that followed, repeated ten times. And it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. In our world today, last 50 years, have things got worse and worse and worse? To the point where politicians and scientists are scared that there's climate change? And I think I mentioned this before at the front. Why does the climate change? Because it reflects the heart of man, hello. That's how it's always been in the scriptures. How hearts man has been is how nature responded. The problems in our world are not climate change, it's not carbon. Well, maybe it is carbon, aren't we made of carbon? <laughs> so there is a problem with carbon. It's the attitude of the carbon, it's not the burning of the wood. So, the word came to him, God's word was rejected by him. Um, the word rejected was the protection rejected. God gave him up or gave him over to his own will. And, of course, the plagues hit Egypt. And the rest was history. Ten times, yeah. So, our God shall come, shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him. It shall be very tempestuous round about him. God's word brought to Moses, to Pharaoh by Moses, but rejected by him, was a fire that became tempestuous all around him. The plagues, the tempest. And for sure, Pharaoh would have blamed Moses. Because that's what we do, eh? We always blame others. He blamed Moses for everything that was happening. But it wasn't Moses' fault. It wasn't God's fault. It wasn't his doing. The condemnation was the rejection of God's invitation, his light, his word, his blessing, his fire. Can you see the parallel? So it's not just 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <laughs> 13 to 18, 1 Thessalonians 5, where a fire shall come before him and it shall devour before him and there'll be all this destruction when they cry peace and safety. That's just a reflection of what's just been going on all the way down through history. That's the parallel. So we need to get the history to explain what the fire at the end will be. I think that's logical. Um, and that's what it was like in Jesus' day. Jesus came to his own. And his own received him not. He brought the fire. And they rejected that fire. They would not allow it to purify them. And so it became very tempestuous about Jesus, didn't it? Very tempestuous. And we're... Almost done. For other foundation... Can no man lay than this that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon that foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. They're, they're, they're two different groupings in my mind. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by, hello, what? And what is fire? The, fire? the word of God. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If we are born again. Because aren't we all born wood? Hay and stubble. That's me. Wood, hay and stubble. But through a miraculous process of the spirit of God, he brings a conversion. And turns... Was it Rumpelstiltskin that turned hay into gold? That's interesting. I don't know why that just jumped in my head. But God is able to turn us from something that will burn up into something that will be purified. And there should be hallelujahs all over the place on that one. Truly. Every man's work will be made manifest. All as the fire, all as God's word will do, will show us his, show us what we have allowed God to do in our lives. That's the fire. Let's keep going. All right, God judges. We've covered three verses, and I knew it was going to be long, and so 
I haven't gone into the last three. Yes. <laughs> but he shall call to the heavens. I'll read them anyway. He'll call to the heavens from above to the earth that he may judge his people. And again, just in a nutshell, the judgment is God making things right. That's God's justice, to make things right. And it begins in the house of God. It's not because he's looking at the house of God, oh, yeah, I'm going to pick out the bad ones. No, 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 no. He begins the judgment in the house of God because that's where he wants to purify first. Because when, purif when he purifies the house of God, then we will go out like fires and share it with other people how good God is because of what he's done in our lives. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. He calls us to offer up ourselves a living sacrifice, enter into the new covenant where we're purified for Christ is in us, the hope of glory. The heaven shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Yes, God is judge. And where he's allowed, he will purify. Where he's not allowed, he gives the people over and they receive their own judgment. How's that for a wrap-up of the last three verses? A bit quicker than the first three? Amen. See, I can do it. And so, there will be tempestuous scenes before Jesus comes in the world. Because the fire will go out. The truth of God's word will go out to those that receive it. Jesus said, many I have which are not of this fold, them also must I bring. And he will purify them. Mixing metaphors with sheep and golden sheep. Okay? Um, but at the same time, it's going to become tempestuous when people, the majority, the leaders, push back against God. It's going to be awful. A time of trouble such has never been since there was a nation. And the, it must be close to the last. Yep. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. I thought I'd just throw this as a final thought. Because this is at the end of the thousand years. Read it, brothers and sisters. Read it and think in the context of everything we've talked about tonight. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. Who does? The wicked. The wicked that have been raised at the end of the thousand years. They go up on the breadth of the earth to compass the city of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. How else can you read it? But God is a destroyer and he throws fire from heaven. But excuse me, what have we just done for the last, I don't know, hour or whatever I've been talking? Wherefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Jeremiah didn't burn anyone. Hello, God is not going to burn anyone. I rest my case. God bless you all. Thank you for your patience tonight. I hope that made sense. Um, I wish we can hear it again. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, yeah, that, that's just yeah, what I, I got out of Psalm 50, verse 1 to 6. Okay, it's just beautiful. Praise God. He is good. His mercy endures for ever, ever and ever. Let's, let's bow and pray. I, He will condemn himself. It says in is it Ezekiel or Isaiah that the fire comes out from, in, from inside of him. I don't have my Bible here, but yeah, the fire comes from within, not from, from without. And so that's self-condemnation. Self-condemnation. At the end, he'll go, yeah, it was all my fault. 2818, yeah. Thanks, Tony. Okay, everybody, let's, let's bow and... And thank God for his, just his goodness. Father, thank you again this evening for blessing our time together. Thank you for giving me a voice that actually got through the night. Uh, and that's a miracle in itself. You are a father of mercy and I thank you. I thank you for the words that you've shared with us from the scriptures. I hope it did make sense. I'm sure it did. I know that your spirit goes before us as we speak and that it, your spirit has touched people's hearts. May you do your beautiful work in us to purify us like uh, the refiner's fire.
that, re that refines the silver seven times. Father, we pray that you'll give us um, a, a great sleep tonight. We thank you again for the wonderful day we've had together, and we look forward to more of this tomorrow. I pray for everybody else, anybody else that's coming up to join us. Uh, may they have traveling mercies, and I just pray for uh, myself and, and the family that are uh, heading back uh, to Brisbane tonight, that you'll give us a traveling mercy as well. And uh, we just yeah, give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. 5.14. That one? Oh, yeah. Good night, everybody, and God bless. When it all goes quiet And I stop trying To fill all the spaces I remember I hear a still small voice From the one I know Calling me home When it all goes quiet I hear your love calling me I hear your love calling me Nothing sounds as sweet when it all goes quiet When it all goes quiet You remind me Nothing separates us Apart from when I turn away Cause I am your child You reconcile us And you feel nothing for me but love Why do I hide? I hear your love calling me I hear your love calling me Nothing sounds as sweet when it all goes quiet And I've been lonely Cause I forgot you And who you really are You're not like me Love never failing You're just waiting Always hoping that I'd remember That I would hear you Calling me, I hear your love calling me. Nothing sounds as sweet when it all goes quiet. I hear your love calling me. I hear your love calling me. Nothing sounds as sweet when it all goes quiet. Sweet when it all goes quiet